So we'll, we're going to move forward here onto another, another problem, uh, and this is called a frozen shoulder. Um, so this is something that, that we see quite a bit. Um, it's not quite as common as rotator cuff problems, but we do see it, and it's really important to, to be able to recognize this. So again, when we're looking at the shoulder joint, uh, here in this picture, we've got the ball and socket uh, is kind of covered up by what we call the capsule. So this is what's surrounding that ball and socket joint. Um, and then the rotator cuff would be on top of this. So the capsule uh, uh, is made up of tissue that um, helps support that, that joint and helps keep it in place. And a frozen shoulder is when that capsule becomes inflamed. Uh, and so it becomes inflamed, it becomes thick, and it becomes stiff. Um, and so when that happens, the shoulder gets stiff and it can be very painful. Um, and it becomes difficult to move and it gets to a point where even pushing it, you can't get it any farther. It gets what we call a firm endpoint, meaning it, you, uh, if I tried to, I couldn't push any further. It's just stuck. So um, when that happens, uh, it can be very painful and very limiting. So this is also known as adhesive capsulitis. Um, so adhesive just meaning that it's getting stuck. And then capsulitis, again, we see itis, so that means inflammation. Most of the time, this can come on just out of nowhere. So. You don't have to have an injury. You don't have to have a new activity. Your shoulder just starts hurting one day and slowly, progressively becomes more and more stiff. Um, sometimes we do see injuries beforehand, or sometimes this is uh, preceded by a surgery, uh, but the majority of cases are what we call spontaneous, where they just come out of nowhere. Uh, there are certain risk factors that we know uh, can predispose people to having this. So things like diabetes, thyroid problems, or uh, heart disease can all predispose to this, but you don't have to have those issues to get a frozen shoulder. Um, a frozen shoulder typically goes through three phases. So the first is called a freezing stage, meaning that the shoulder is getting inflamed and it's starting to get stiff. Then it gets to a frozen stage where it's basically stuck in a position. It may not be as painful during that time, um, but it's not moving very well. And then finally it goes through a thawing stage where uh, the scar tissue and the capsule is starting to loosen up and it's moving better and that can also be a pretty painful stage. Uh, we know that getting through all three of those stages can take varying amounts of time. So it depends on the individual but it can last anywhere from months to sometimes even years. Um, most of the time I would say the majority of cases I've seen last between three and six months. Um, but um, And that's usually because people again wait before they come in. They, or putting it off, and which is, is completely fine, because we know that if we did nothing for a frozen shoulder, eventually it would go away. So if we had no treatments, if we didn't have anything that we could do for it, eventually almost all cases of it go away completely and your know, shoulder gets back to normal. Um, but there are some things we can do to help speed it along and help make it more tolerable during that time. So the first and most important thing, uh, again here, is physical therapy. So, and that's really the first, the second, and the last treatments for this, um, because this is a problem of the shoulder being stiff, and so what a therapist can do is help you stretch that back out and get that motion back. And so that's, that's the most important thing for this. Uh, steroid injections can also be helpful for this, because again, we have inflammation, so the steroids can help calm down that inflammation and hopefully make this move along a little bit faster and make it more tolerable. Sometimes uh, people have uh, stiffness that doesn't go away, so the inflammation doesn't get better, uh, therapy's not helping, and so sometimes we have to do what's called a manipulation, which means that uh, we bring them into the operating room, we put them to sleep, uh, and we actually move the shoulder for them and break up that scar tissue. Um, and we do it while they're asleep because we don't want to do that in the office because they won't like us very much. <laughs> so, um, so that's the manipulation under anesthesia. And then sometimes we even have to perform a surgery to release that. So sometimes those tissues just will not break up or sometimes it's, they're so stiff that if, that if we're to push on it too much, we would actually end up breaking the bones instead of breaking up the, the stiffness in the capsule. And so. When that's the case, sometimes we have to perform a surgery to actually release that. Pretty rare, but sometimes it does come to that. So uh, the most important thing about a frozen shoulder is that we have to take care of this first before we take care of anything else surgically. So even if you have a rotator cuff tear or you have a labral tear or you have uh, other problems that are going to need a surgery, it's really important to treat this first uh, because if you go into a surgery with a stiff shoulder, you'll come out of a surgery with an even stiffer shoulder. Um, and so that's one thing that we really try to identify this uh, at the very beginning because we want to get it taken care of before we worry about anything else. And oftentimes if we take care of this, everything else gets better anyway. So, um, so that's good to, to look for. Next we're going to move on to another structure in the shoulder, so uh, the labrum. Uh, and this is uh, 
by itself is a whole host of different injuries. So we're going to kind of try to lump things together just to make it a little uh, simpler. But uh, the labrum itself, when we're looking at the shoulder, so here we're looking at just the socket side of the ball and socket joint. And we're looking at it uh, kind of from the side. So again, looking directly from the side. And we can see the socket here. This is the shoulder blade up here, um, and then the shoulder blade back here. And then these are the rotator cuff muscles along the outside. The labrum is this uh, kind of bumper of tissue that sits around the edge of the socket. Uh, it's a special type of cartilage, and it, its purpose is to help stabilize that joint. So again, we talked about this is a really shallow socket and that the shoulder is inherently pretty unstable. So what the labrum does is it helps increase the contact surface and helps stabilize that joint. So if, we're, if we go back to our, uh, our, our golf ball sitting on a tee, you can imagine that the labrum, which we can't see on the x-ray here, but it kind of serves as kind of a wedge to keep that ball centered on the socket. Um, and so that's its main function. There are a number of different ways that you can injure your labrum. Some of them come from trauma or an injury. So uh, a dislocation of the shoulder, where the shoulder, the ball uh, comes out of the socket joint and then goes back in, uh, falls on outstretched arms, or pulling of the arms. So if you are falling and grab onto something, or if something's falling and you try to catch it, uh, these can all cause injuries to the labrum. It can also be caused by repetitive motions. So repetitive lifting away from your body, um, or uh, overhead activities. So we see this a lot in throwing athletes. So those same major league pitchers, uh, when their arms are, are bending backwards at ways that I can't even demonstrate to you, um, they are putting a lot of stress on that labrum. And so almost every pitcher is going to have some sort of tearing or wearing down of their labral tissue. Um, and for them, sometimes it can be a problem, but for them it's also somewhat of a, an adaptation. So it's a way for them to be able to do that. So we don't need to be able to throw 100 miles an hour. They do, uh, and so their shoulders are made to do that. Uh, treatment of a labral tear really depends on a number of factors. First is on the, the symptoms that you're having. So uh, is the problem that you're having pain in your shoulder, or is the problem that you're having instability in your shoulder? So. Instability is a, is a significant problem, especially uh, when we're dealing with younger patients. So if the shoulder's coming out of socket repeatedly, we know that, that can do damage to the cartilage. And so we want to repair that and stabilize that shoulder and keep it from happening. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Pain is another issue. So pain can sometimes be treated with those other non-operative treatments, but sometimes it doesn't get better that way and sometimes it does need a surgery. The location of the tear also uh, uh, helps guide our treatment. So. Uh, when we look at the different parts of the labrum, I'm going to come back here. Uh, so when we talk about the superior labrum, that means the labrum at the top of the socket. Um, when we talk about uh, the labrum farther down, either in the front or in the back, uh, that's a little bit different. And different injuries cause uh, uh, damage to certain areas. And then we treat certain areas differently as well. Um, so you may have heard of what's called a slap tear. So that's when we're looking at the superior or the top portion of it. Um, when we're looking at the front bottom portion of it, that's what we call a bank art tear. So we often see that when people dislocate their shoulder. Um, and then we can also see tears in the back or the posterior aspect of it. Um, and those we see a lot in football linemen, weightlifters, um, and then also a lot of overhead athletes can get tears in that area. The last thing we always think about are, are the, is the patient, so the goals and expectations of the patient. So if we're talking about that major league pitcher, then he's got pretty lofty goals. So he needs to be able to throw that, that fastball, and millions of dollars are riding on it. Um, if your goal is to get back to working at a desk or uh, working around your house, then, then that can change things, and, and we may need to tailor the treatment to, to meet those goals. So. Uh, Non-surgical treatment, uh, you're gonna, we're going to see kind of a repeating theme here of things that we can do for these, for these issues, because the non-surgical treatment especially all kind of fits into the same, uh, um, same boat. So we can do activity modification, meaning uh, change what you're doing, avoid things that are bothering it. Uh, Anti-inflammatories, again. Injections, again, can be helpful. Um, and it's important for these injections to be in the correct area. So we, if we want to really get to the labrum, we have to put the needle all the way down into the shoulder joint itself, uh, which we can do, but it's important to, to know that it's different than an injection for a rotator cuff. Um, and then again, physical therapy. So uh, we talked about the ball and socket joint. 
If we can strengthen the muscles that help stabilize that shoulder, it'll put less stress on the labrum itself and it can sometimes decrease the pain to bring it down to a tolerable level. Um, and really, most labral tears <coughs> will not require surgery. Um, again, it depends on, on where that tear is, what's, what's caused it. Um, but we see labral tears a lot. So when we do a rotator cuff surgery, we look at everything else while we're in there. And oftentimes, we'll go in and we'll see a tear in the labrum just like this. Um, but it's not necessarily causing a problem. So sometimes, just like everything else, things can wear out with age and they don't necessarily have to be fixed. So, um, and this is something else that if we were to go out and get MRIs of everyone, we would find lots of these and we know that lots of them don't need a surgery. Uh, but sometimes they do. So uh, tears that uh, fail non-surgical treatment, so we've tried everything else and there's still pain and there's still limitations in function. Um, or people who have, like we uh, spoke about before, repeated dislocations, those oftentimes need to be fixed uh, because we, we don't want that shoulder coming out of socket over and over and over again. Usually repairs uh, for the labrum are done arthroscopically, so again, through small incisions where we look inside with a camera. Um, sometimes we do uh, have to perform an open repair, which means an incision where we look at it directly, but the majority of uh, repairs uh, at this point are done uh, through the scope. And we again use suture anchors. So. Here we're looking at the ball and socket joint. It's kind of on its side this time. So here, th this is the socket down here. This is the ball, just kind of out of the picture a little bit. This is a big metal probe. So this is just an instrument that we're looking at. And everything's kind of magnified when we're looking through the scope. So this metal probe, the end of it from here to here is only about four millimeters. So just to give you an idea of the scale of things. Um, and then these are the suture anchors. So this is an anchor that's embedded in the bone here. And then these are the sutures that are attached to it. And they are wrapped around the labrum, which is this tissue, to help bring it back to the socket and secure it down where it belongs. So we use these kind of techniques for, for multiple areas around the shoulder. Um, here's just another little schematic of it. So again, we have the ball and socket joint. This is a tear on the front bottom portion of the labrum. And here we have the suture anchors in place, kind of holding that place and bringing it back over to where it belongs to let it hold. And again, just like the rotator cuff, we're just holding it there until it can heal on its own. Um, but we know that without help, it doesn't always get there. So we're going to uh, keep moving on here. So a labral surgery, uh, typically uh, people are in a sling for about four weeks after a labral surgery. Uh, we again start physical therapy right away because we don't want that shoulder to get stiff. Um, and then the total recovery time for this is much more variable because it depends on the, the injury and where that tear is and, and what, we're, what we fixed. Uh, so it can be anywhere from three to six months.